Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, today uh, I'm going to be going through micro and uh, the first few lectures that you guys got this week. Uh, so yeah, Ryan, can you yeah, move to the first slide? Yeah. So we're going to go over the intro to microbes, natural barriers, strategies of control, and fungal infections. So let's get started. Okay, so the first thing that you would have noticed on your lecture slides is that you're going to be learning about types of microbes. Okay, so um, the first three that you're going to be introduced to, or the main three, are going to be archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes. It's not that important for you guys to know the difference between archaea and bacteria. If you are curious, a main difference is that uh, archaea lacks bacteriaglycan in its cell walls. But definitely, you will need to know the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, now, microorganisms is a pretty broad term, but basically, it just means anything that you need magnification or a microscope to see. And usually, they have a cell diameter of one to 100 micrometers. So, let's move on. Yeah. So, let's look at prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So, they're chemically similar, but structurally distinct. Now, what that means is they both contain the same amino acids, lipids, proteins, carbs, et cetera, um, and are surrounded by a plasma membrane, but their structure is completely different, okay? So prokaryotes are smaller, unicellular, and they divide by binary fission, and they do have a complex cell wall, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, now, the three major shapes, again, this is really important for you guys to understand, is cocci, bacilli, and spiral. Now, this is going to come up in histology questions. Um, maybe in a couple of weeks, you guys will be doing a practical where you're going to be looking at different types of bacteria. So it's important to understand the different shapes and what that kind of means for the microorganism. So um, if you look at bacteria, I think the most important thing for you to understand, and the thing that comes up a lot on exams, is really the cell wall. So I guess this is what we would consider high yield. So what do we know about the bacterial cell wall? Uh, I think the main thing that you need to understand is really what does a gram positive and gram negative bacteria mean, okay? So the most important thing to understand is that a gram positive bacteria has a thick layer of peptidoglycan in its cell wall, okay? Now, what that means is when you do a now you don't really need to understand how a gram test works because it's very low yield, um, but you just need to know that gram positive is purple, and that's because uh, the peptidoglycan retains the, the dye that they use to stain the bacteria. Okay, gram negative is not going to be purple; it's going to be pink. Okay, uh, because gram negative bacteria are surrounded by a lipopolysaccharide membrane. Now, that's again another important thing going to come up in your exams definitely. Um, might not be directly what's the difference, uh, but it could be what color would you expect the gram stain to be for specific bacteria. So uh, it's important that you are able to identify that gram negative has lipopolysaccharide on the outside, um, which means it stains pink. Now some bacteria you can't really do the gram stain um, because the waxy lipid layer on the exterior um, stops the gram dye from actually penetrating into the bacteria. Okay. So for that, specifically, it's for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, again, that could be an exam question. I think I've seen that a few times. So what's the test you would use for this? So remember that it's an acid fast stain um, because it's got the waxy lipid layer on the outside. Yeah, so now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to dive into bacteria and viruses and what are their mechanisms that help them survive, what helps them replicate, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so starting with bacteria, um, we're going to start with spores. So spores are used to by bacteria to exist in environments that are really, really harsh. Okay, so maybe the bacteria can't survive in the environment, but the spore can. Now that's really important. So what the bacteria does is it puts its vital important DNA that's used to replicate inside a spore. And these spores are supposed to be able to survive 
really extreme conditions. And then they only start replicating again from the spore when the conditions become more suitable. Now, only certain bacteria can produce them, but if they can produce them, that's, um, that's really beneficial for their survival. Now, another important thing to remember is that only one spore can be produced per bacterial cell, and that spore has all of the important information um, in order to help them survive. The next one that they have is pile or fimbriae. Um, they are slightly different, uh, but basically what they are is adhesin. So they help them adhere, hence adhesin, um, to surfaces, other cells, mucosal membranes, etc. Um, and occasionally they allow the formation of biofilms. I think I've seen that in an exam question as well. So maybe keep that in mind um, that um, Fimbria and pili are what allow the formation of biofilms. Okay. That's very important. Okay. Now, the next one, flagella, I think most people should be familiar with this if they've done biology before. So, um, the flagella is what allows the bacteria to be motile. It moves um, with the ripping like motion of the flagella. Um, and now, some bacteria have many, and some have only one doesn't really matter. It's just an important thing for motility. And you can see it on the diagram, yeah? Um, there's little tail-like structures protruding up the end. Now, capsules, I think, are really quite interesting. So capsules are used to prevent phagocytosis, but um, they also have a few other functions as well. So they resist phagocytosis because it uh, mimics the host cell sugars. So the body can't actually identify the bacteria as a foreign pathogen. Um, instead, it recognizes it as self, and it allows the bacteria to grow and replicate inside the body. Um, it also aids in adhesion because it's a polysaccharide layer. It's actually sticky. So sometimes capsules can help bacteria stick to mucosal surfaces or stick to each other and um, allow greater replication. So it's uh, pretty important. Um, but again, another way that the bacteria can survive for longer. Now, normal flora is again something that's slightly, I mean, it's talked about, but it's not, it's not too important. You just need to understand, I guess, what normal flora is and what it represents. So uh, normal flora is the, the bacteria that lives inside the body naturally, okay? So less than 1% of microbes actually cause disease, okay? So as soon as you're born, um, your body is exposed to a large amount of bacteria, like as soon as you're born. Um, these become a part of your normal flora and you can live normally with them in your body, okay? So some bacteria can cause opportunistic infections. So this is basically what happens when you're sick and then a bacteria that normally resides in your body um, or sometimes doesn't normally reside, um, takes advantage of the fact that you're sick and um, causes more infection. Okay, so examples are listed. Staph aureus, definitely probably the most important bacteria that you're going to learn about. Um, and strep pyridans is also pretty important as well. Okay. Uh, another important thing to know, again, for exams, is that last dot point, they might ask which sections of the tract or which sections of the body would you expect to find bacteria? or would you expect to be sterile? So knowing that these regions in particular are supposed to be sterile is really important. Okay, so this is just a list of medically important bacteria. It's not that important. Like you can see, it's in your lecture slides. Um, I think probably if you had to memorize, you would probably memorize these ones. All of them are pretty important, um, especially Staph aureus, and strep pyogenes. Um, e. coli is really important for gram negative. If you've ever got a UTI and they ask what they think it could be, your first guess should be E. coli. And yeah, on the side, we've also got different stainings. So you can see that the gram negative ones are clearly pink. So there's no room for like uncertainty. It's very clear. The gram negative ones are pink and the positive ones are purple. Okay, so. Moving on to viruses. Viruses are, I think it's a bit more straightforward um, because there's really not much that goes on in a virus. 
So they are acellular obligate parasites, which means that they're technically not classified in the three domains. So before I mentioned bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Um, so viruses, acellular, so it doesn't count because technically it doesn't have cells. Um, they can only reproduce by invading other cells, whether that be humans or other animals. Um, so the main, I guess, structure that you need to know is that a virus has a genome, capsid, and, um, and an envelope of stolen cell membrane. Yeah. So if we look at the diagram here, that's basically all you need to remember. Um, now, the classification of viruses depends on uh, its genome, its morphology, etc. But what you really just need to be able to do is focus on the DNA, RNA, uh, single or double stranded. Okay? Uh, that's probably going to come up again. I've seen it a few times. Um, they might give you an example of a, a virus, and you're expected to know a few of them, the type that it is. So, is it DNA? Is it double stranded, etc.? So, if you had to focus on classifications, just focus on if it's DNA or RNA and single or double strand. Okay, so medically important viruses, again, hepatitis, all of these, I think, that come up on your lecture notes, I think you probably need to be able to identify the type of virus it is. Again, by, by that I mean, like, is it single-stranded, double-stranded, um, and is it DNA or RNA? These ones in particular, you will need to know that. Um, retroviruses as well, it's a separate type like HIV. So they use reverse transcriptase to turn RNA into DNA, but it's that's kind of low yield, it's not too important. So, all right, that's your introduction into, <laughs> into um, microbes. And so moving on from there, we've got natural barriers and innate defenses. So these are going to be like your first line of defense and immunity kind of. Uh, it's, there's going to be a crossover. So probably soon you guys are going to have lectures on immunology. Um, and there's going to be a bit of crossover between this and that. So maybe get ahead now by learning like the innate defense first line uh, so that it's a bit easier for you when immunology lectures come up because they tend to be pretty long and tiring, I guess. So. Disease basically means it's an interruption of the normal structure of and function of the human body. Um, and it's usually manifested by a set of symptoms or signs, right? So common causes are the pathogens we were just learning about. That's the whole point of microbiology. It's basically, you're gonna learn about all of these in the coming weeks and how they cause all of their pathogenesis, which is basically how they cause infection. Um, so what we just did before was just an introduction into what is um, a bacteria and what is a virus, but going forward, you're gonna learn more about how they actually cause infection, okay? So we have two types of immunity. We have innate and we have adaptive. I don't think adaptive is covered in microbiology, but innate is a part of microbiology, okay? So let's see, what is a part of our innate system? Okay, so these are going to be your first line of defense. I think this is very high yield um, because it does come up in the exams. So you need to know basically all of these, the anatomical ones meaning your physical barriers, stuff that traps pathogen, right? So mainly it's going to be your skin and your mucous membranes. Um, mechanical is the mucus and the cilia because as the cilia beats, the mucus is pushed up your trachea and then out. Um, now, you've also got coughing and sneezing, vomiting and diarrhea. You can kind of tell how that's mechanical because you're basically, your body is moving in order to try and expel something, right? So being able to identify the type of barrier is also really important. So knowing what's mechanical, what's anatomical, etc. Okay. Now, what is an antimicrobial slash chemical factor? So this is going to be stuff like tears, um, lactic acid, pH in the stomach is really, really low. So only a few bacteria can actually survive in that environment, like E. coli. Um, 
your tears um, have lysosomes in them. So that helps destroy bacterial cell walls and our stuff like defenses and cathodicin, oh, cathodicin, sorry. Um, you're gonna learn about that in immunology. So don't worry about too much. You just need to know kind of in microbiology sense, I guess you need to know like what category of defense they are, okay? Um, yeah, so cellular components is discussed in way more detail in immunology. Now, normal flora is really important. So I think, what's on the next slide? Otherwise I'll discuss it. Yeah, okay. So this is a pretty gigantic image. I think you don't need to know everything in this image. Obviously that would be way too much. Um, but kind of getting an understanding of how normal flora work and the fact that we have a large quantity of microorganisms that just reside in our body. Okay, so types of normal flora are resident and transient. Okay, so resident means they live in your body, like basically from when you're born, they're just like you were exposed to them and they stay there. Yeah, most people have pretty similar resident flora, um, and it can be even more similar if you look at individuals from like a specific area. Yeah, like internationally, it might be different, but in Melbourne and stuff we should have similar levels of resident flora. Transient flora comes and goes, so just, I guess that really depends on your environment and stuff like that. You don't need to memorize all of them, just remember the common ones, uh, examples of Staph aureus and Streptococci. Now what these do is um, they take up space that uh, potential invading pathogens would have. Um, so I guess it helps your body protect against invention. And these bacteria might actually fight off other bacteria because they want to keep their space in your body. And another thing that happens is it's not really, I mean, it's important to know, I'm not sure how much microbiology it is, but when you take antibiotics or you take antivirals um, and you're killing off, oh, no, not antivirals, sorry, antibiotics, and you kill off like a normal flora, you might create opportunity for opportunistic infections because the space that the normal flora would usually reside in uh, is now empty because the antibiotics has killed it. But it's not that important. Just know that they take, take up space that otherwise invading pathogens would want. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, okay. All right, so yeah, in the skin, um, compete with pathogens for space and the gut, they can produce uh, secretions, which actually not only help um, us, like uh, synthesizing and excreting vitamins, which is really important for us, um, but also they can create excretions that kill other bacteria as well. Okay, uh, the vagina um, has a very acidic environment that suppresses growth, and the bacteria, like the normal flora that live there, help with that acidic environment. Sorry. Yeah, so inflammation. Uh, this is kind of your first dose of immunology, really. So. Uh, it's a non-specific response to injury. Um, pathogens or irritants that occurs in vascularized tissue. So there's a few um, symptoms and signs that you really need to know for inflammation. It's very commonly assessed. Now you might actually need to know the Latin words as well. So I'm pretty sure that has come up before as well. I haven't included them here, but I'm sure it's on the lecture slides. So the main symptoms, they're all pretty visible. So if you see a patient and they've got redness, heat, swelling, you're going to automatically think it's inflammation. It is inflammation, basically, right? Now, in more severe cases, you can get pain as well and loss of function. Um, loss of function is really, really severe. Now, this is a little bit detailed, but basically chemical signals, um, so cytokines, which are signaling molecules, such as uh, tumor necrosis factor um, and prostaglandins and histamine, are released by mast cells. So mast cells secreting histamine. I feel like if you did biology, you would know that. Uh, if you didn't, then I guess now you know that. Um, and this causes vasodilation, which brings more immune cells to the site, brings more blood to the site, uh, which in turn will bring more heat to the site. So if you've got more blood, blood is red, so you're gonna have more redness. Uh, blood is also warm, so you'll have more heat. Now, the vasodilation increases the permeability, which allows more immune cells, um, which means that you're going to have swelling because if it's more permeable, then it's going to be swollen. Okay? Um, now, pain can occur due to damage to the tissue, 
And loss of function might occur if you really have severe inflammation and a really severe injury um, to the point where like, the body can't really fix whatever's happening. Or like the immediate response might be to just stop blood flow to that region by completely making it inflamed. Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> Again, what I just said, yeah. So fever, otherwise known as pyrexia. So if you see that, it's synonymous. Um, it comes with inflammation. So usually if people have an inflammatory response, you might notice that their temperature rises. It doesn't really matter where the inflammation occurs. It kind of increases your body temperature in, in total, okay? So um, the main signs of fever obviously high temperature so the standard temperature is around 36 point something to low 37s so above 37 usually we start to think maybe it's beginning to be a fever okay so um, it's usually associated with sweating um, vasodilation which is what we cause redness and hyperventilation because your body is starting to breathe because they're trying to um lower the body temperature. So it's kind of similar to how when dogs get really warm, they start to pant. Um, it's the same thing when people are hyperventilating, they're trying to like release heat from their body. Okay? Now, the purpose of the fever is to speed up the immunolog immunological process because high temperature means things is occurring faster. Um, and if you have vasodilation, that means you've got a greater immune response because more cells are moving. Um, but also a high temperature might be enough to kill some pathogens because again, all the proteins in the pathogens have specific temperatures that they work well in, have specific pHs that they work well in. So what he thinks that if it raises the temperature, it can kill off some of the pathogens, uh, which is true. Um, so again, that's another reason why we have people. Okay, so strategies for control. Um, that's going to be talking about. Well, strategies. Wait, next. Oh, okay, right. I was confused as to why that was. Yeah, okay, no. Go back, go back. <laughs> okay, so um, a quick summary of cellular components of the innate response. Sorry, I, yeah, <laughs> I missed the slide. Okay, so macrophages are cells that are phagocytic, so they engulf the pathogen and then they want to kill it. Okay. Now, they kill it and then they take the antigen and they present it to the adaptive immune response, which will initiate the adaptive immune response. But you don't need to know that right now. You'll learn it in immunology. The neutrophils, um, again, is phagocytic. So you need to know that both macrophages and neutrophils are phagocytic. Okay. Now, it is a white blood cell. So what you'll notice is, for example, in pimples, um, when you have pus and like in the acne, um, that is just a bunch of dead neutrophils that have engulfed pathogens and then died. Okay? So all of that pus is going to be dead neutrophils. If you have really bad infections and you might see like people who have like lumps on their skin. And then like, I think everyone's seen those videos on YouTube where they pop it and it's just full of pus. That's just a part of the immune response. That is neutrophils going to the site of infection and trying to kill or slow down the pathogen. And in the process, it turns into pus, okay? And lastly, natural killer cells. So they really important. They secrete a protein or hormone called perforin. Uh, it causes infected cells to undergo apoptosis, okay? So again, it's a, you're gonna learn in more detail all of this um, in your immunology lectures, but I guess knowing this much kind of will help your understanding. Um, and at the bare minimum, this is kind of what you're expected to know of all of these cells. Yeah. Okay, so strategies for control, that's going to involve how do we like, limit the growth ourselves? Like what are the, the steps that we as people can take? Um, so you'll see. So chain of infection is the steps that allow infection to begin and then spread, okay? so. This is probably in your lecture. I'm not sure if you've seen it or not. Um, but basically what you're gonna have is you're gonna have an infectious agent, um, a reservoir, 
and then portals of exit means of transmission, a portal of entry, and a susceptible host. Now, usually you're going to start with um, a susceptible host, but it can literally be anywhere in this chain. You can have a mistake. Um, no, sorry. Anywhere in this chain allows infection to occur. Now, what we as doctors or people in general should try to do is try to break the chain. Okay. So how do we do that? So um, first thing we can do is look at types of transmission, okay? So um, you can get, you can transmit a disease through contact, which is direct, which would be host to host, indirect, which would be um, maybe you've come into contact with a secretion, like if someone sneezes on you and you've got their snot on you, which doesn't sound very pleasant, but potentially that's an example of indirect. Droplet is in the air, the the um, pathogen is in the air in the form of a droplet. Airborne means it's literally just in the air and it's very easy to spread. Those are the worst diseases when you have outbreaks because it's very hard to control. It's really important to understand which diseases are droplet and which diseases are airborne uh, because that is also assessed. Um, inoculation, that's mainly, you're mainly gonna see that with um, two types. So either being bitten by something poisonous, venomous, you'll, you'll learn the difference if you already haven't, or something sharp. So basically you're injecting yourself, maybe something like heroin users um, tend to have hepatitis because sharing of the needles um, allows the spread of the virus, okay? Same thing, HIV can also be spread through sharp injuries, yeah? Uh, vehicles means water, food, so um, diseases that can be spread through water, uh, found in water, contaminate water, or contaminate food. Like salmonella can be found in chicken. If you don't cook it all the way through, um, then you eat it, you're probably gonna get food poisoning because you're gonna have salmonella, okay? Transplacental um, in utero, there's a few diseases here. We've got an acronym called TORCH. So these are all of the diseases that can be or are commonly transferred in utero transplacentally. So you've got toxoplasmosis, um, syphilis, um, rubella, herpes. But yeah, these are the different types of transmission. Okay. Portals of entry. So portals of entry are going to be different parts of the body in which um, pathogens can enter the skin. So you've got respiratory, eyes, urogenital tract, the GIT, skin and placenta. So placenta is going to be um, in utero, but otherwise um, all of these um, places are areas in which pathogens can enter if there's an opportunity like in skin, if their skin's broken. Um, if you inhale an airborne pathogen, it's going to be in your respiratory system. Sometimes you might get a pathogen on your hands and then you rub your eyes and it can go through your um, conjunctiva, which is going to be your eyes. Um, so all of these, we're going to try and, our goal is to try and protect them and make sure that we don't have them. Yeah. Okay. So um, what is a susceptible host? A susceptible host is an individual who is more vulnerable uh, to infection. Okay. So typically they have underlying disease. Uh, they might be taking antibiotics because they are sick with something and it's going to be the problem that I mentioned before. So that's going to be where you kill the normal flora and then you're susceptible to infection by other pathogens, okay? Steroids and immunosuppressive drugs are people who take those are very vulnerable because their immune system's not working. Um, surgery, again, because you're being opened up, especially invasive surgery, um, you're being opened up, so you're going to be vulnerable to pathogens coming in from the outside because you've literally got your whole skin and system exposed. Yeah, so all of these are just examples of individuals who are more vulnerable. Yeah, so, nope. Okay, so the growth of uh, microorganisms. <laughs> Not sure what's happening here.
Sorry, is this where you want to go from? Uh, Sorry. No, where you're going forward. <laughs> you have to go <laughs> You have to go the other way. Okay. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, right now. Okay. A couple more slides. Yeah, okay, there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, um, the growth of microorganisms can be controlled by what's listed there. So, preventing excess, killing the bacteria, um, trying to minimize the reduction of numbers, or I guess minimize the growth. So, this is really important high yield stuff. So, what influences microbial growth? So, you need to really look at temperature, moisture, pH, oxygen, and their availability to get nutrients from the body. Okay. So if you take away some of these things, then you're going to be able to kill or at least inhibit the growth of the pathogen. Okay. So how do we do this? So the three things. Um, so the three things that you need to worry about, or that you really need to understand, is cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. Okay. Now, these, I don't know if it's heavily assessed, but it's always on the exam. So you really need to know the difference between these three, cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. Um, and I go into them a bit more. So basically cleaning is gonna be removing bacteria off organic matter, okay? So um, if anything is moist, it should be removed immediately. Uh, must occur, so you have to clean something before you disinfect or sterilize it. And it involves, you know, like washing your hands. There's hot water, so. It's just normal cleaning. Disinfection uses antiseptics. So it kills most of viable microorganisms. So the difference between disinfection and sterile is that sterile removes every single thing. Uh, disinfection means it's most of them, okay? Now, if sterile kills every single thing, if you think about the previous part of the slides where I was talking about the parts of the body that are sterile, there's literally nothing there that's living, okay? It's all just your body. So there's no normal flora at all. So it's important to understand that sterile is completely nothing. Okay, so um, levels of control. This is this is the part of the, the, the cleaning thing that is assessed, okay? So what we need to be able to do is identify a few things. Firstly, how risky is this thing that you're cleaning slash disinfecting or sterilizing, okay? So if it's gonna penetrate the skin or mucous membranes, then it's considered a critical risk, okay? Um, so if it's penetrating the skin, it needs to be completely sterilized, okay? The examples of this will be um, needles, implants, any surgical equipment, so blades, um, scopes that are going in through the skin, everything needs to be sterilized completely. Um, the semi-critical risk, um, it just needs to be free from all um, microorganisms, excluding spores. So you'll find that sometimes spores are hard to kill off. Um, so that's why there's a difference. Now, um, these are usually going to be stuff coming in contact with mucous membranes. The spores don't need to be killed off because usually um, the mucous membranes can handle them. Um, but again, ideally, if we could um, sterilize anything that's going inside the body, it's better. Now, it's gonna be the stuff that you, sorry, the stuff that is of semi-critical risk is endoscopes, respiratory equipment, um, stuff that's like, it, you know what it is. It's like, it's not piercing the skin, but it's going inside the body, okay? Lower risk is the basic stuff. So beds, stethoscopes, your hands even, stuff that's gonna touch the skin, but not penetrate or go inside the body at all. So for those ones, you just need to clean them, like with washing them in soap or maybe disinfecting them. Yeah, so sterilization. So this is, um, yeah, this is really important as well, the stuff in bold. So you need to know the difference. I think I've seen this in every practice exam I've done for this topic when I was in year one. Um, so you need to know what is the time, what is the temperature for moist heat and same for dry heat, okay? So those four statistics, like 121 degrees, 15 minutes, 134 degrees, three and a half minutes, 170 for an hour or 160 for two hours, really need to memorize those numbers um, because it will come up, okay? So moist heat is done is in an autoclave. So it basically it's, it's like warm 
water that's boiled. So it's like steaming the objects, okay? Um, it causes inactivation of the proteins and kills everything that could be there because it's so hot that nothing can survive, okay? Dry heat is the same kind of process, but instead of by, um, instead of inactivating the proteins, it's going to kill off the cellular components by oxidation because it's too hot, it's simulating the oxidation, okay? You don't really need to know too much about how they work, I think. Even though you should, um, the more high yield stuff is definitely the degrees and the time. It's like a quick fact check question that they put in there every year. Okay. Um, radiation, so it sterilizes surfaces by damaging the DNA. Um, it's good for, a UV radiation is uh, good for disinfecting, not very penetrating. Ionizing radiation um, breaks down the DNA of pathogens and stuff. So um, it's good for heat sensitive materials that you can't put in an autoclave or that you can't use dry heat for. So stuff like food and disposable items might use ionizing radiation. Okay. Filtration is physically removing all microorganisms. Uh, it cannot be it's used for materials that can't be sterilized by other methods. It's not that common. And chemical, um, again, kind of low yield, but can't, like it's used for equipment that can't handle the heat. Um, so ethylene oxide gas, or maybe vapor phase hydrogen peroxide. Again, examples, it's used to clean maybe tubes because tubes plastic might melt in the heat. But again, focus on the heat one, it's more important. Okay, chemical disinfectants. I'm not gonna read through all of this um, because it's, it's just like, I would just be reading the slides to you guys. Um, it's not really that important. You should focus not really on the type of disinfectant, but maybe where you would use them. So when it's free of dirt, grease, um, blood and organic matter, that's really when you use them because you can't use a chemical disinfectant if there's other stuff contaminating it. It has to be like um, relatively cleanish and then you disinfect. That's why you always clean before you disinfect and sterilize, because then otherwise the disinfectant's not effective. Okay. Um, again, you have to completely soak, or like cover the article in your disinfectant. Um, but yeah, it really just depends like which chemical disinfectants you use. Depends on the type of microbe, what's the toxicity of the chemical, how are you using the chemical. Um, how are you using the item that you're disinfecting? But yeah, just remember the free of dirt, grease, and blood. That's really important. Okay, so nosocomial infections is basically hospital-acquired infections. So this is going to be one of the leading causes of death in hospitals, unfortunately. Um, and that's going to happen because, um, again, unfortunately, uh, we can't manage... Um, the spread of diseases in some instances. Um, so it is pretty unfortunate, uh, but how do we prevent it? That's, I guess, what we're whole, that's the whole point of us learning about chain of infection and stuff is and methods of control so that we can try and prevent um, all infections in general, but for us as doctors, nosocomial infections is something we really don't wanna see, okay? So how do we prevent it? You need to monitor sterilization, make sure that all items that need to be sterilized are sterilized, disinfected are disinfected, cleaned are cleaned, all right? So you need to make sure that you're very diligent. You're trying to break the chain of infection wherever you can. So wear gloves, do your five moments of hand hygiene. I'm pretty sure you guys have learned that. Um, if cases, if there's patients with very like contagious diseases, diseases, infectious diseases, you put them in isolation, um, you wear the right uniforms, all trying to minimize hospital acquired infection. Okay? So that's really important that we try and do that. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk to you about today, feels like I've been talking forever, um, is fungal infections. Okay, so what are they? So I think, honestly, fungal infections, even though it's like a big part of microbiology, it's not that important um, to know all the different types of fungi, et cetera. 
it's, I think if you understand the cellular components, then you're probably going to be better served. Okay. So fungi are eukaryotes, so don't get them confused with bacteria or archaea. They are multicellular organisms. And the really important thing is, again, like a bacteria, its cell wall is what helps us distinguish fungi from other pathogens. Okay. So there's three things, all of them are present in fungi cell walls. So it's going to be beta glucans, um, ergesterol, and chitin. Chitin's probably, I mean, they're all really important, but I guess in my head, in the exam questions I've seen, chitin is the one that comes up. Like, which one would you find in a fungal cell wall? So I think chitin's very really important, but all three of them. Really important. Now, fungi can be classified into yeast, mold, and dimorphic, and I think we'll go into that a little bit later. Maybe not. Oh yeah, we do. Okay, good. Okay, so um, yeasts, uh, they sell, they're cells that reproduce by a budding. Okay, so they're usually unicellular and they produce round colonies on sugar. Okay, so you just need to remember that it's budding. Okay, so yeasts bud and are unicellular. Um, examples, Candida, Cryptococcus, and Pneumocystis. I would probably, I think Candida albicans is really important. I can't remember why, but it's just like in my brain for some reason, but it was a lot, mentioned a lot in year one. So I guess you know that Candida is a type of yeast, but it also can be a demo. Okay. So mold is basically when it grows by extension. So it grows by spread instead of multiplication. That makes sense. Okay. So basically what's happening is it starts as maybe a small dot and then the dot just grows and grows and grows. It spreads by extending the hyphae. Um, it's called apical extension. Okay. These are multicellular and mold is okay. All right. Uh, mold is um, multicellular. And the really dangerous thing about mold, which we'll talk about in a second, is it produces spores, which can be inhaled. So um, unfortunately, a pretty common type of respiratory disease is going to be aspergillus. And it has a very high mortality because of how quickly mold can grow and spread. Um, but yeah, mold is it's also very commonly seen. You might see it on food, like, um, you know, like mold, you know, moldy food. Or you can see it even like in really wet areas because dampness really suits the growth of mold as well. Um, dimorphic organisms, so this is the worst type, basically. Um, it can exist as both yeast or mold, uh, depending on its conditions. So really important, actually, is the temperatures. So molds exist at 25 degrees and yeast exists at 37, um, which is very dangerous because 37 degrees is invasive to humans because that's the human body temperature as well. An example of a few dimorphic fungi is penicillium, uh, which you might know because that is what makes penicillin, which is basically the most commonly used antibiotic in the world. Uh, if you don't know that, you will soon because it's in pharmacology. Um, Candida, okay, and sporophores, which I will talk about in a second. Right, okay. Yeah, so. Um, Fungal disease can cause allergies through three main mechanisms. So you've got allergies, um, or did I say allergies? It can cause disease through three main mechanisms. So allergies, so you can have an allergic reaction. So aspergillus can cause bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which is a mouthful, but basically you're having a bronchospasm because of the presence of the fungi. Um, toxins as well. So some fungi can produce toxins which uh, a detrimental to your body can cause adverse reactions, might even induce sepsis depending on what type of toxins are released. Uh, sepsis is basically when your body shuts down because you've just got a bacterial infection and it's really, really severe actually. Um, and infection. So you could have a cutaneous, subcutaneous or invasive infection and I'm pretty sure I will talk about that. Yes, okay. So. Superficial microsis. So basically what this means is um, you're gonna have fungi or like a fungal infection that's quite superficial. So it's gonna be like in the skin. Uh, 
even on the hair and nails here. Yeah, so even on the hair and nails as well. Okay. So this is usually going to be from human to human contact. Like you might touch someone and they have the infection on their hand, and then it, the, you'll they'll notice symptoms a bit later. Okay. Um, again, sweaty, moist, sticky. That's where fungi thrive. Okay. So maybe like areas such as your uh, in your groin region or in your armpits or in your foot, like if you're an athlete, you'll be sweating a lot because you'll be running or playing some kind of physical or doing some kind of physical activity. Um, the sweat, that hot, wet environment is really good for the growth of fungi. Okay? Now, cracks in the skin, again, so that's going to go back to the chain of infection. That's a portal of entry. So cracks in the skin can lead to secondary infections as well. So these are a few examples. I think it's actually pretty important that you know these. So especially uh, tinea corporis, so that's going to be your ringworm, and tinea pedis is athlete's foot. I mean, you might as well learn all of them if you're learning those two. So tinea corporis is jux yeah? So um, the diagnosis is going to be they take a, like a scraping off your skin and they can grow a culture and see. Uh, the treatment is, is going to be a topical um, antifungal. It can be an antibiotic, but that's usually not the way you treat fungal infection. Yeah. Okay, so subcutaneous. So that means it's gone inside the skin, right? Subcutaneous inside the skin. So uh, the main one and the only important one, I think, for you guys is really sporothrix shenki. Um, so this is going to be from getting stabbed by a rose thorn. So it's again from inoculation because it's inoculation means it's going through the skin. Um, it can stay local or it can spread through the lymph nodes and you might notice um, several red like lesions on your skin. Um, and it's treated with itraconazole um, and saturated potassium iodide. But I don't think the treatment is that important. It's just really knowing that if you have a subcutaneous, if you, like, again, I think I've seen this in a question. Um, if you see a rose thorn, immediately go to sporothrix because that's what the answer is going to be. All right, so invasive mycosis. So this is when they have the ability to access your internal organs. Um, in a no nosocomial infection, it's usually acquired by the Oh, sorry, it's usually acquired by the respiratory tract because you're breathing it in. Or um, in hospital, it can be a nosocomial infection um, through like a catheter, for example, or, or anything that is foreign to the body going inside and it's not cleaned or sterilized properly, then it can transmit um, fungal infection. Okay, so let's look at candida. Um, so let's see, candida albicans, I'm pretty sure I've just been told that it's a yeast infection that happens in the vagina. Um, it's pretty common. I think you'll find that a lot of women suffer from that. Um, now, yeah, it can also, well, it can also happen in immunocompromised patients. Um, and it can also cause endocarditis, which is a really severe disease that affects the heart. Um, you'll learn about that next semester. Um, but basically, infective endocarditis is life threatening. Now, candida has quite a high mortality rate if it's not um, treated quickly. So, maybe not the yeast infection, but definitely um, the glabrata and the cruci. Uh, they're very resistant to treatment and you need really fast treatment. Okay? So, Diagnostic culture is through PCR. Um, they grow it quickly, so and then maybe you can do a blood work as well. Okay. Cryptococcus is a budding um, type of fungi. Again, it has a high mortality. You might notice that with all of the fungal infections, they have a much higher mortality rate than bacterial or viral. Um, and that's just because of they. Again, it's probably because they're eukaryotic as opposed to prokaryotic. So they're bigger, they're more menacing, um, they can replicate um, to grow much larger than bacteria. And um, it's harder for the body to kill a eukaryote than a prokaryote. Okay? So um, 
examples again, gonna be Cryptococcus neoformans and Jati, but I think neoformans is definitely the important one. So that's gonna be spread through bird feces. So again, I'm pretty sure I've seen that before. Any questions? So just remember um, the key ones. So you're probably gonna to need to know albicans and neoformans, and that neoformans is spread through bird feces. Diagnostic is going to be a stain, um, and yeah, we'll move on. Okay, so um, this is the last slide, actually. So pneumocystis, the yeast-like fungi, um, it's only found, well, not only, but 99% of the time it's found in HIV patients, which is sad. Um, the marker is they usually infect patients who have less than 200 CD4 cells which you'll learn about, the T helper cells. Um, so they attack very, very immunocompromised people. Less than 200 is very unhealthy. Yeah. Um, if you want to know the important one, it's going to be pneumocystis gerovecci. And the mortality is lower because usually it's identified really quickly uh, because HIV patients are always monitored because they're quite unwell. Aspergillus, again, I talked about that before, that's going to cause the respiratory infection. Um, you can inhale it, it's especially its spores. You can inhale its spores found on rotting vegetation. And unfortunately, it has up to a 90% um, mortality rate in all countries. Um, it's a slightly better in more developed countries, which have access to better medicine. But again, it's quite a severe disease. Yeah, thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat and I'll answer them in the Okay, thanks, Pranay. Um, <clears throat> so Yumi and I are going to cover cellular response to injury and the three lectures involved. So first, cell response to injury. What we want to cover is that we have reversible injury, and that's when the um, you can go back to the normal cell, the normal cell, and then irreversible injury occurs when it's so severe and it can't adapt. You can't go back to what it normally was. So what will happen will either be necrosis or apoptosis, two forms of cell death, but they're a little bit different and we're gonna go into that later as well. So adaptive changes, you've got physiological and pathological. Physiological, you have response to normal stimuli. And so this means that the, it, it includes hormones and endogenous chemical medications. Pathological changes occur when we have a lot of stress and the cells will modify structure and function. You can see from the diagram before that adaptation doesn't necessarily mean that it will go back to the same form it was. It will be a little bit different. Principal adaptive responses. So you have four very important things to know here. Hypertrophy, hyperplasia, atrophy and metaplasia. Just notice here that when we say trophy, we talk about increase in size and plasia being the number. So they're different things. And then atrophy, decreased number and size and metaplasia is change. So that doesn't mean increase or decrease necessarily. And if the adaptability um, adaptability is exceeded or the stress is too severe, we have to undergo cell death. Here is what Pranay was talking about with the five signs and the Latin, ruba, tumor, cala, dollar, and functio laser. Um, and these will be something you'll have to know. So know what they are and then know the names for them in Latin as well. So factors which influence tissue response, we have size and volume. So it's going to be more likely to recover as a small area of damage. It's also going to be more likely to recover if the type of tissue is labile, which means it can um, regrow rather than permanent tissues or stable tissues. I'll talk about the difference between these three as well. And then the duration of injury. So if you have an acute short-term injury, it's more likely to recover compared to chronic injury. And so therefore large permanent chronic um, injuries will more likely undergo adaptation or cell death instead of uh, recovering and 
becoming what it once was. Consequences of cell injury. So you have reversible and irreversible. Reversible um, means that the injury was within its limits and cells can go back to its stable baseline. You have regeneration, which is restoration, and that's different from adaptation, which cre creates changed different cells. On the other hand, with irreversible injury, you have to have cell death and then you replace those cells as well. So some examples of labile, stable and permanent. Um, so for labile, it's skin. If you have dead skin cells, then it regenerates and this we don't normally have problems with that unless you have huge, severe degree burns. And that's something you talk about um, later. Uh, stable is pancreas, so you have some ability to regenerate, but it's more likely to regenerate if you have acute pancreatitis compared to chronic pancreatitis and cells in the heart, for example, um, if you have injury, then it's permanent damage and it's neither labile or stable. So that was lecture one. Lecture two is cell death and necrosis. So we're going to talk about the difference between necrosis and apoptosis. So why would a cell have to undergo cell death? Sometimes um, the injury is very severe and the main things are mechanical, energy failure or DNA damage. You've also got the reasons why as well. Let's look at necrosis and apoptosis. So if you look at this diagram, this is a regular cell and necrosis occurs when it swells up and then it will sort of burst and then all of the toxins that had accumulated inside the cell explode and the harm of this is quite intuitive. It means that all of the toxins from the inflammation has exploded and is now prone to infecting other cells. That's why when you have um, necrotic tissue, it's like dead and it's spreading. And sometimes in very severe cases, you have to amputate the, um, the limb or whatever. On the other hand, apoptosis is cell death, but it's much more controlled. Instead of swelling and then exploding, you have the condensing of the cell and then it fragments into these things called blebs. The verb for that is blebbing. And then after it blebs, um, it slowly disintegrates within the blebs. And so you don't get that explosion that you get with necrosis. So for apoptosis, it's active, it's regulated and controlled, and it is initiated by caspases. Caspases ensure that the cellular components are degraded in a controlled manner. And through apoptosis, you're able to remove the cell without producing harmful toxins. So if you talk about cell death, which is sometimes necessary, apoptosis would be considered the good kind of cell death. That's different from necrosis, where it's passive, accidental and premature death with uncontrolled release of inflammatory cellular contents. Therefore, this results in an inflammatory response in the surrounding tissue as well. That's why it's so harmful because it, it sort of infects surrounding tissue. It can be caused by the following things as well. Reperfusion injury is really interesting and it's something that you'll need to know as well. What happens is sometimes you have ischemia, which is when um, sort of a tissue or an organ has no blood supply and so it has to adjust to this environment of having no oxygen and so if you had someone who experienced um ischemia to the heart meaning some tissues in their heart were not receiving blood then in the medicine we wouldn't immediately like attach blood supply to them because if a heart or if some tissue has experienced no oxygen and then immediately experiences an abundance of oxygen, then we have something called reperfusion injury occur. And that's when damage that occurs, damage occurs after blood supply is restored to a tissue or organ after a period of ischemia. The reason why this happens is we have something called oxygen free radicals. So when molecular oxygen is reintroduced into tissue that was previously ischemic, it undergoes reduction and it leads to the formation of oxygen free radicals. 
So oxygen derived free radicals impair the function of membrane bound enzymes enzyme systems. So that will impact metabolism. And then it amplifies the production of those oxidant radicals. And then through the positive feedback loop means that it would um, exacerbate the degree of the injury. So the point of all of that is if there's tissue that has been um, ischemic or there's no oxygen supply, we have to be really careful and consider how long has this tissue been um, ischemic for, and then that's that'll impact the care that you provide for the patient. Here's this um, image from the slides, and it sort of shows you the harms of ischemia reperfusion injury. So you have DNA damage, protein modifications, and membrane damage as well, because you've got lipids in the membrane, and that's why it's so harmful. Okay, we'll move on to lecture three. Okay, so I'll just cover the third part of cellular response to injury. I'm going to skip over this slide because I think uh, Caroline covered it really well and it's just a review of the first part of cellular response to injury, but the notes are there. I'll skip over it though. So I'm going to talk about wound healing in general. So this slide is going to cover a general overview of wound healing and then in the next few slides, we'll go over two specific types that you should be pretty familiar with. So in general, um, in the general stages, the most important thing is to kind of understand the purpose of each stage. And then from that, you can figure out why certain events take place. So if we started the first step, which is hemostasis, the goal there is to minimize the loss of blood and also to minimize the spread of potential infection and debris from the injury site. So to minimize the loss of blood, that would require things like vasoconstriction and clotting happening. And then to minimize the spread of potential infection, you would have things like inflammation and macrophages trying to phagocytose the debris. The second step is inflammation, which Pranay went into pretty well. So those steps that he talked about are what occur in this stage. And the overall goal there is to control the bleeding and allow a bunch of cells to come into the site of injury, whether that's immune cells or repair cells. The third step is proliferation. So the goal there is to rebuild the damaged tissue. So what happens is granulation tissue forms. And I've put there what granulation tissue is. It's just the primary type of tissue that um, will fill a wound in the process of, of healing, particularly in something called healing by second intention, which I will talk about in the next few slides. But that's pretty much where there is a large um, injury that's quite extensive. And granulation tissue is mainly made up of macrophages. So that'll help to kind of clean up the uh, site of injury and prevent any infection. Also, in, sorry, can, yep. So also in the stage of proliferation, you would get an ECM that starts to form and that's just to stabilize the area. And then also angiogenesis, which is pretty much the formation of new blood vessels. And that makes sure the site of injury has a good supply of cells and nutrients to regenerate again. Then you've got the last stage, which is maturation. So that, um, step is just to refine everything that's been done and make all the structures a bit more organized to increase strength of the new wound. Okay, so I said there were two specific types that you should be familiar with. So this is the first type, which is healing by first intention. And so this occurs in clean and uninfected wounds. So a surgical wound, for example. And um, so in terms of the four steps that I just covered before, what's key to healing by first intention is that in the hemostasis step, both sides get held together by a fibrin joint. So in um, a wound that heals by first intention, the edges are usually close together, close enough together so that a fibrin joint can form in, the, in between and hold those two edges together. Um, it's kind of like a glue between the two sides. 
Um, and then inflammation will happen, as I talked about in the last slide, and then proliferation. In this step, you have collagen will come and replace the fibrin that's in that joint. And then you have maturation. So you have the new epithelium will go along the top of the collagen. As you can see in the bottom image, that purple line starts to become continuous again. And then also some of the collagen will stay in under that epithelium that's just grown. Healing by second intention. This happens when there's quite a big wound and a lot of tissue loss. And usually in these wounds, in these wounds, the edges don't come together or are not very close to each other. And usually by the end of the process, you get a scar formed. So hemostasis and inflammation are kind of the same as what we've seen before. But in the stage of proliferation, you get that granulation tissue that forms and your genesis that happens. And then you also get fibroblasts, which then become myofibroblasts and they will lay down fibrin in the damaged area. So kind of similar to first intention where you had a fibrin joint, you also get fibrin that's laid down in this damaged area, although it's just a more extensive or larger area of damage. And then you get the epithelial cells that grow over the top, similar to first intention as well. The last step with second intention is maturation. And this is the step where the scarring kind of starts to happen. So the myofibroblasts that are in, um, that have been laying down the fibrin, they begin to contract and that causes the tissue to contract. The goal of that is to reduce the amount of tissue that needs to be repaired but that will then be all replaced by collagen and it'll form kind of like a thick fibrous scar. So these are just some of the factors that affect tissue repair. There's don't really need to memorize any of these, but I think the yellow ones are a good one to have an understanding of. So things like infection are going to infect, affect how easily your tissue is repaired because your body has to take care of the infection as well. Nutrition, your body kind of needs the right amount of things and supplies to be able to fix an injury. Um, and also the pore perfusion kind of ties to that in that your body should be able to transport all of those nutrients or cells um, to the site of injury. But yeah, it's not so important to remember these. And just the last point, these are specific um, wounds. These are wounds specific to the bones and the GIT. This is not very high yield, but it's good to have an understanding of what happens in these two specific um, circumstances. So in bone healing, you have in the hemostasis step, you get a fracture hematoma that gets formed. So a hematoma, which is um, this step is what the mo leftmost image in that one that I've put there. So a hematoma is just bleeding that happens outside of the blood vessel and it causes the blood to kind of collect and pull together, as you can see in that photo. Then the next step is inflammation as normal. And then you get proliferation. So when it's a bone injury, you get something called a cartilage calus that gets formed by fibroblasts and osteoblasts. So fibroblasts fibroblasts are things that produce fibrin, osteoblasts are bone cells. So a cartilage calus is kind of this bridge of cartilage that will connect the bone fracture together during the repair. And then in that last step, you get the bone being remodeled back to normal size. So the protruding sides of the calus will be made smaller. So the bone is more normal. Then you have the, in the GIT, you have two specific wounds that occur. So you have a mucosal erosion, which is a smaller wound and usually heals by first intention. And then you have mucosal ulceration. So this one will usually heal by second intention and it's usually a larger wound with more tissue loss. And the key differences to know there are that um, once the healing process has occurred, 
you have only a loss of part of the mucosal thickness in mucosal erosion, whereas in, in mucosal ulceration, you'll have loss of the full mucosal thickness. And then with, in terms of the generation of epithelium, which happens in the proliferation stage, you get the full regeneration of epithelium in mucosal erosion, but only the surface um, epithelium will regenerate in a mucosal ulceration. That's pretty much all I had to cover for that one.